Well, good morning, Thunder Nerd. Good morning. You know, I figured one of those things that when you're a guest speaker, right, Tom will be here, so that me and him would be, there's only about 10 people, you know, maybe my family would be here, and people are three years old. But I'm just so excited to see almost 100 of you here to share in this message, to share the hero of God's put on my heart for the last six weeks now since I found out I was going to do this message. And, um, Boy, I hope he's got something for you today. Uh, I know that, that he's here, he's present, he's in these words, and I pray that I can get out of the way so you can hear him, right? That's, uh, that's the primary goal when we take this stage. So, I've been reading Proverbs a lot the last couple of years. I don't know how many of you have read Proverbs, but Proverbs uses the same word a lot. And I mean a lot. This word fool. Right, the word fool it describes the actions taken by those who may not always choose the right way, right? And, and so it's, it really kind of keeps hitting home that, that why do we keep talking in Proverbs? Well, you also know what Proverbs is, right? The book of wisdom. King Solomon was kind of given whatever he asked for, what he asked for was wisdom. He wanted to know the world like God knows the world. And so the book of Proverbs is him writing most of it. I know it's not all the time, but it's known as the book of, of his knowledge, the book of kind of defining and helping us to learn to be discerning about what is true, what is false in the world. Uh, when we're looking at things through the wrong lens, right? Or looking at this kingdom versus God's kingdom. And so this idea is so clearly presented in Proverbs that there's a way to live and there's a fool, right? It's a soul of and so that really got me thinking. Because I know I felt it many times. Have any of you ever felt foolish? You ever done something where you felt like you were a fool? If not, this is going to be a really short message. <laughs> so I have much more than I would like to admit uh, in my life. Right? So we think about what is a fool, right? What makes a fool? Well, there's a clear difference. In Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes, say that 10 times fast, uh, 10 to, I believe it is. I'm not one of these people who can rattle off Bible verses, but this is one that Brother Leonard shared with me yesterday. It makes a distinction and says that the heart of the wise turns to the right, while the heart of a fool turns to the left. Couldn't be any clearer, right from left, right? Clear distinction, there is one and the other. Again and again in Proverbs, we see it illustrated through these you know, beautiful analogies uh, you know, telling us what makes a fool. So if there's a clear distinction, what is it? So I turned to this world's way, right? I looked it up in, in the online dictionary and looked it up in the th thesaurus. And I wanted to share with you a few of the entries that, that come in because these words may hit you differently than the word fool, right? How about buffoon, clown, moron, nerd, nitwit, stooge, twit, bird brain, blockhead, bonehead, bore, clod, Cretan, dimwit, dolt, dope, dunce, dunderhead, I like that one, ignoramus, imbecile, lightweight. Maybe it's just me. I have never been confused with a lightweight. I haven't heard that one. I don't think anyone's ever calling me that. Loon, nincompoop, ninny, numbskull, oaf, sap, schlemiel, another fun one, simpleton, turkey, right? There's so many words. And all these paint a picture, right? And that's what we try to do with the thesaurus is really hone into what is the idea behind this word. A lot of people mistake foolishness for ignorance or for being dumb, right? Those are very different things, right? Ignorant means I'm without knowledge. I've not been exposed to it yet. I am ignorant to the truth. I am ignorant to whatever it is you're speaking of. Now, of course, these words can only be used derogatorily, but they're not meant that way, right? To be ignorant really isn't a state of innocence, right? My two-year-old, for instance, is probably ignorant to the complexities of the way that we're so divided on politics, right? That's not her fault. She hasn't failed at something because she's ignorant to it, right? But there's also dumb, right? And I can speak to dumb because boy have I been it in my life, right? Dumb means I may be aware of it, but I just don't get it, right? I haven't put the thought into it. It hasn't hit home for me yet, right? And, and Tom talked this morning in Bible study, and he, he talks a lot about it, this, these Greek words, right? The Greek does such a better job of splitting hairs between the, the meaning of a word, right? They talk about oida versus gnosko, 
They both mean to know, right? They both mean you're no longer ignorant, you now know it. But oida means I know it, I assent to it in my head, I understand that it exists, and gnosko means I know it in my heart. Think about that difference for a minute. Think about what it means to know something in my mind, Christ died for me, and what it means to know it in my heart, Christ died for me. You feel that difference? Right, so this idea that, that, you know, maybe we're splitting hairs in semantics, but from being ignorant to being dumb, right? I, I, and dumb might be the wrong word, but I liken it to that oida idea. I only know of it, but it hasn't meant something to me yet. It hasn't hit home with me yet. And then we talk about a fool. A fool is someone who is no, no longer ignorant. They've been made aware. They probably even understand it, and they choose differently. Now there's an action in there, right? So this isn't just a state of mind or a, a note about your character being a fool. It's, I understand there's something better, but I don't choose it for me. This is where I tend to fall. And I'm hoping it's a connection point for some of you. I'm, I'm hoping that some of you have experienced this the way I have. This is one of those things that brings me back to the pit, so to speak over and over again in my life. I can remember, I think, maybe I'm over-glorifying myself, but I feel like I can remember every time I've said a hurtful word to someone. Do I remember what I said? Not really. Do I remember what they said? Not really. Do I remember the circumstances or why we were fighting? Not really. But I remember the look on their face. And boy, does that return to haunt. Every time I start feeling good about something, that maybe God's taken hold of my life and I'm, I'm creating something positive for somebody, one of those faces flash up in my mind. But you caused this hurt. You know, words can be such a powerful thing and we can hurt people and, and sometimes in our immaturity we can intend that. And sometimes in our foolishness, we cannot. But this message is for those of you who have felt that way, who have been dragged back to a past sin, to a hurt you've caused. This to me is exactly what today's readings speak about. So when I think about a fool, I can't help but think about human nature, our very design. We are created in sin, right? We're born into sin. I shouldn't say we're created in sin. We're born sinful. That means that we're born to choose incorrectly, right? We have to train our children up from a young age how to share because naturally they don't want to, how to be appreciative, how to have manners because naturally that doesn't come to us. We are created in sin. We are created to be foolish to make these choices. It's natural for us. So I think it's fair to say that man is designed a fool. Any of you who disagree, ask your wives. <laughs> They'll probably, I see a lot of hands shooting up, you know. Men, don't turn this back on them, trust me. No, a kid, you know. Man, of course, means all of humankind. So ladies, you don't get off that easy, right? So how do we fight what we're created to be? How do we fight the reality of our creation, not necessarily what we're created to be, because I believe we're called to more. But how do we learn to discern? And I think this is where Paul is speaking, where he's speaking from. Right, there's this cycle of condemnation. And, and Proverbs says, like a dog returning to his vomit, so does a fool return to his folly. What does that look like? Maybe that looks like, you know, what vomit is, right? A dog ate something, made them sick, their stomach couldn't handle it, so they puked it up. And their first thought was, oh, I should eat that again. A little different when you think of it that way. That's how we are when we're returning to our folly, right? When we're returning to our sin, when we're going back to be condemned by it again and allowing us allowing it to keep us from moving forward, right? We're created to press forward. 
But so often we get trapped in this dungeon. I'm not good enough. Look at all the people I've hurt. Look at how I failed as a parent the other day. Look at how I took advantage of that business relationship. Look at that awful thing I said to my spouse just because I needed to feel stronger or bigger in that moment. No, I can't be free from that. I can't be move forward because that's who I am. I keep doing it. The evil I do not want to do, I keep on doing. The good I want to do, I cannot, right? I know that's not even close to right, but you know, you all know <laughs> it's something close to that. I don't have the, the verse off the top of my head, but how often do we return to our condemned former self? How often do we let that lie define who we are moving forward? Hmm. You know, this is where we find Paul. To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. You know, for <laughs> all of my life, one of the stories I've always told and one of the things I've kind of bragged about is that I don't read. I don't know why that became a source of bragging, but I uh, had never read a book. Uh, in fact, through college, uh, even in the law school, it's just not something I did. And I would, people would always ask me, you know, what's your favorite book you've ever read? And my answer was always Clifford's Birthday, because in second grade, Pizza Hut bribed us with a free pizza if we joined the book club and we had to read a book. And so Clifford's Birthday was the only one I ever got cover to cover. Uh, you know, an exciting crescendo and denouement, as you literary folks would say, uh, when Clifford got to celebrate with his friends. Uh, the most meaningful piece of literature I had ever in, digested up to that point. You know, and it's kind of dumb, but part of that is I've never been one to fit in a box. I've never been one to accept the expectations, right? Everyone says, oh, you're a lawyer, you must read so much. You know, it's just not something that, that is in my nature to do, right? And so... I've now, and you know, this was something in my Christian walk, was that I'd never read the Bible. And I would ask you to raise hands. I know some of you have also never read the Bible. Uh, I know that that's a common thing. The Bible is pretty difficult to read, especially if we view it as a novel or as a textbook where we're supposed to take a chapter at a time, learn something from it, and move on, right? And it's just not written that way. But I've worked with this chronological plan for the last three years now, since I met Tom. He challenged me. Okay, you know, let's get into it. Let's see what it has to say. What was nice was that this app we have will read it to me, right? So I don't have to read it, right? All those words get awful boring looking at them all the time, right? Some of you can relate, I know. <laughs> but it reads it to you. And so now I've gone through the entire Bible. I'm on my third time through it now. I've been listening to these devotions every day. So that means this passage I've gone over at least three times, probably more, but it never hit home. It never caught me what he was saying. So I want you to hear it carefully. There was a given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Hmm. So here's Paul. Right, Paul was persecuting and killing anyone who believed in Christ, anyone who professed their faith, anyone who said that he in fact died and was risen again. This was his very life. The calling that he believed God had placed on him was to keep this blasphemy from spreading, was to kill the people who believed in it. And on the road to Damascus one day, he was stopped. He was blinded and he encountered Jesus himself. And that day... He went from Oida to Gnosko. That day, he formed a personal relationship with his Savior and all of a sudden understood all this studying I've been doing in my life led up to this. And he had that breakthrough moment, that realization. So did everything come up roses for Paul? Wouldn't it? If he was going to be the mouthpiece to speak to all the Gentile world, wouldn't God have made his path easy? No, I was given a thorn in my flesh that I may not boast. 
because it's not about me. What is that thorn in his flesh? A messenger from Satan. I was hung with a noose of having the liar around me all the time to remind me of all the things I used to do. To convince me I'm not good enough to move forward. I'm not good enough to live out this new calling. That must be a mistake. Because look who you are. You're defined by the things you did in your past. Hmm. You ever thought those things? I know I hear that a lot. I feel condemned all the time by those lies that I hear. And Paul knew this. Right? So I think about the thorn in my flesh, right? This fact that, that Satan knows the truth too. But his goal is to convince you it's not true. His goal is to convince you that you were born a sinner forever a sinner you will be and you're going to die with it. Miserable like me. Hmm. You know, God says himself, come to me all who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. A lot of times when we live with these lies, we live in this condemnation, we live in this cycle of being a fool, returning to our vomit, whatever analogy you want to use, we get tired. Not just physically tired, spiritually, emotionally tired. It's just hard to keep going. It's hard to keep fighting. It's hard to stay positive. And God, you say you'll give me rest. Where is it? Right? You're the cosmic vending machine. I saw the one I request. I pushed the button and it didn't come out. Three times I begged with him. I pleaded. Take this away. You have the ability to make this easier for me. And what does he say? My grace is sufficient for you. He doesn't say, yeah, here, I'll make it easier for you. He doesn't say, I'll rebuke Satan from ever tempting you. That's up to you to keep that prayer alive, right? He says, my grace is sufficient for you. Stop worrying about it. Stop returning to the chains I freed you from. Why? Why do you do that? I love you and I'm here. I give you rest. Come to me. Come to me. Read the word I've written. Root yourself in it. Know it. Don't just know it, but know it. And that's where you'll find rest. Because that's when you'll be able to discern what's true and what's a lie. And when you can stop and hold those thoughts captive and tell them, no, away from me, Satan, that's when you find that rest. It's not you're doing something wrong. I want to encourage you in those moments. I want to encourage you that what you're hearing is a lie. You were made for so much more. You, yes, you were created for a heavenly purpose, knitted together in your mother's womb. Your father knew you before the dawn of creation. And he calls you heavenward with a purpose. In Philippians, Paul says this, to a, somehow to attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already been made perfect, but I press on, press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. God has called me heavenward for a purpose in Christ Jesus. I can't be a slave to this thorn. It's just going to be there. I got to learn to live with it. I got to learn to rebuke that liar that I've been given, that tormentor. Hmm. Then, maybe I do have some control over this situation. Maybe I do have the ability to help appreciate and understand my freedom that I've gotten when Christ died for me. Hmm. So I, I, he says, one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining forward toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize. This is a very, very commonly quoted piece of scripture, right? Probably something you've all heard. I press on. He's not just saying, I press on because everything's good. I press on in spite of the negativity. 
I press on in spite of this thorn that hurts. Every time I breathe, it cuts a little more. But I press on to what I've been called to do, to what I've been created for. You know, I've been watching probably way too much of the Olympics. Maybe some of you have seen some of it too. You know, the Olympics are such an impressive display of athletic capability. You know, these people work for years and years and years. Their diet is perfect, their nutrition cycle, their exercise cycle, their sleep cycle. Everything about their life is controlled. It's scientific. It's down to the minute. And then they come out and go on display, and all of us are introduced to them. We have, you know, a 30-second story from NBC that makes us love their family and want to root for them. And then two minutes in the pool or 30 minutes on the shooting range, whatever it is, they're on display, and we see them, and we're in awe of their athletic capability. I hope, anyway. Any of you who are going, oh, that's easy, might be a different story. I haven't seen anything that looked easy. Even the bouncing on the trampoline thing, that it's, I don't know how that's an Olympic sport, but I couldn't do that many flips in the air, I promise you. It would not be pretty. <laughs> so we look and we see these people who are, you know, I think of it like the swimmers, because obviously the first week of the Olympics, that's what we get every night, right? We get so much swimming. And I love to watch, not thinking about what the announcers are saying and not thinking about what's going on in the race and the drama for the medals. I just watch the way their bodies glide through the water, that they just seem to float, right? Like it's just this machine where they've, they've done this repetitively thousands and thousands of times and just everything is working in sync, working in harmony. And that's what I think of when I hear t Paul talking about pressing on in the race. You know, it's easy for us to think that things have been easy for these Olympians. They've probably lived a spoiled life, you know, their parents had all the money to put them in the right camps and they got trained and they could always afford to eat at Whole Foods, so of course their diet's much better than ours, you know, whatever it is. It's easy to think these things, but then we hear some of these backstories and we hear about the pain that they've gone through or injuries or, you know, there was a gal last night who had a broken elbow like three months ago and here she's swimming and ends up the third fastest swimmer in the world in the freestyle. You know, that's overcoming a thorn, right? That's continuing to press on regardless of what is trying to hold me back. You know, maybe that's a real world example where we see this and as great as it is, every once in a while one of those athletes has an interview and gives glory to God for what they've gone through. Gives glory to God for easing those sufferings enough to make this possible. <laughs> Maybe we all have a story like that. Maybe you have a story of something you've gone through, a time you've been tested. It's a story that's going to inspire somebody else. A story that might make them do something great for somebody else and teach them to be a servant because they saw the way that you served humbly. Imagine if you miss that opportunity because you're dwelling on the past. No, I'm going to stay at home today. I just don't feel like it. I'm not going to go to church and interact with all those people who always seem happy because everything's great in their life. I need to sit here and be miserable today because I've made all these mistakes. I'm not good enough for that. Hmm. Just imagine what we, what we might miss out on. So, you know, we talk about the Bible and say, here we root ourselves in the Word and we learn it, we read it, but what good is it if we don't apply it? So I hope that this is an opportunity for you to apply it in real life, to stop and think and be discerning. What's the thorn in my side? What is it that I've been yoked with of having Satan tempting and lying me to me about? Because in those moments, I want you to hear what's true. And what's true is that Christ died for that sin. Christ doing that means that God doesn't know you did it. When you go to confess something to God, he thinks you're crazy. What are you talking? You didn't do that. Jesus did that. Why are you trying to take the blame for something he did? Think about that. Think about that like you're the, the father in that situation. And your kids are coming to tell you something they've done. 
Don't take the blame for that. Don't get locked in that lie. Don't be limited by that belief. You didn't do that. I created you for a purpose. Get out there and do it. Be energized. Right? I strain forward for what is ahead. I don't just run the race. I don't just jog. I'm straining. Every fiber in me is pushing to get away. To get away from what? You know, the Bible also says <laughs> something kind of funny that I've seen on, you know, memes and shirts of people who don't like to exercise. Right? It's... Uh, the wicked run when no one is chasing them, right? That's what we say about marathon runners, right? Well, someone is chasing. That fool you used to be is chasing you. That's what I'm straining to get away from. I'm running away from that me that used to be that Satan keeps trying to bring me back to, that keeps chasing me. No, I'm done with you. I'm moving forward. I've been able to discern that's a lie, and I'm going to heal. I'm going to allow myself to heal. Now, there's something that's not very popular in American society. I'm going to take the time to work through this, to heal from it so that I can move forward, so that I can move toward the prize for which God has called me heavenward. Maybe that's a good challenge for us. You know, one of my favorite biblical messages comes from the movie The Lion King. I know that seems weird. But there's a scene in it when Rafiki, the Gibbon, I think he is, some kind of a ape or whatever. I, I don't know classifications of animals very well, but he's the guy with the colorful face and the gray hair that's always with Simba at the beginning, and Simba's talking about his past, and Rafiki just cracks him over the skull with his cane. Oh, that hurt. Oh, yes, the past can hurt, to do my terrible Rafiki impression. The past can hurt. Absolutely, it's real. Absolutely, you did those things. You lived and experienced those moments. You've had those faces of hurt that are burned into your memory. But it's not the end. It's not the end because there's a cross. There's a cross on which a Savior died for you. Yes, you. To not suffer from that sin. There's a cross on which he stretched out his arms. So I've taken your sins and I've thrown them as far as the east is from the west. We can't even conceive of that. He didn't say as far as my fingertips are apart. He didn't give us something we can visualize. It's as far as the east is from the west. And I remember them no more. Hmm. It is finished, he said. Now I won't do it the justice that Tom does. He speaks about to tell us die and the I think it's the perfect present tense. Sorry if I get that wrong, Tom. Uh, you know, where it's, I went to the beginning of time, I went to the end of the time, and I went to now, and all in between, it is finished. It is done. You are not condemned. You're no longer a slave to that sin. That's the truth I want you to hear and hold on to. Maybe you've said something hurtful but it is finished. Maybe you hurt someone intentionally because you needed to feel bigger, but it is finished. Maybe you cheated at business, you cheated at a game, you cheated in a relationship. Maybe you really screwed up. But come to me and it is finished. Believe in me. You are no longer a slave. Maybe it's the seven deadly sins, right? We're slothful. I like to lay around and watch 16 hours of Olympics coverage a day. Oops. Maybe you've experienced lust. You're lost in your own heart. You've committed adultery, right? But it is finished. Greed, envy, wrath, gluttony, vanity, Avarice, unfaithfulness, failing as a parent, failing as a friend, failing as a church member, failing at work, not adding up to enough, but it is finished. It does not define you. You were created and designed a fool, but we don't have to stay that way. 
We don't have to continue making those choices and living in that condemnation and living in that slavery because we've been set free. And who the Son sets free? Nice. Is free indeed. Those chains aren't there. So don't let them hold you down. So we strain forward, right? Depression is real. Hearing a voice that I'm not good enough is real. And I can speak to that because I've suffered with it for 20 years, 25 years. I've experienced the ideation of suicide. I've experienced attempts. Sometimes it's so hard to keep going. It's so hard to quiet the lie, and that's okay. But once you take it, process it, heal from it, and discern what's true and what's not about it, you've been given the power to move forward triumphantly, to press on, to win the race for the prize that you've been called heavenward. And because it is finished, you can stand triumphant, no longer a slave. As you move forward and you press, up, press on to a life that can glorify your Father, it starts right now. You are free right now. Right now is the moment when you can start living in your calling. If you don't know what it is, that's okay. There's a lot of loving people around in this room, in this community, who will help you to find out what it is. We all have spiritual gifts, and it's one of the hardest things to figure out about ourselves, but we can see it in others. You were created for a purpose. And I pray that you're able to free yourself to live in that purpose. Maybe that's evangelism and ministry. Maybe it's baking, making coffee at the coffee shop. I don't know what it is. I don't know what your gift is, but I know you have one, and I'd love to help you find it. I don't know what the, the things are you can do in this world to live in it, but I'd love to help you find it and encourage it, and I hope that everybody has that same mentality, that that's how we create disciples, by joining in each other's lives, by being part of the struggle together. I'm going to sit with you, and I'm going to hear about your pain, and I'm going to empathize and understand, and I'm going to encourage you that there's a way through, and that there's something better to move toward. There is a prize for which God has called you heavenward. Yes, you. You were created purposefully. You are beautifully and wonderfully made, knit together in your mother's womb, with a calling on your heart and a purpose for your life. And I want you to start living it today. Be encouraged. So that maybe in the end, you too can hear what we long to hear. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. For you lived a life that glorified me. You stopped, quieted the lies, and heard the truth and applied it. You know, I think this is what they were talking about when Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This life and peace and glory with your Father is here and now, inside you. <laughs> what a different world it would be if we all lived in that. So I hope that this makes you feel lighter today. As Tom always says, we hope you leave understanding discerning that you can leave everything at the foot of the cross. It's what I love so much about the way that we do communion here, and it's changed now, and, and those of you who remember back at uh, Eagle Creek, we used to do it in small groups, and, and because the music was playing and everything was loud, Tom had to yell, but it, that yelling always seemed like enthusiasm. Your sins are forgiven, and you can go at peace. Hear that today. Those sins of your past don't define you. They don't have power and authority over you anymore. They are all forgiven. It is finished. And you can go in peace. Amen?